day which has been coming for about two years now. As we wrap up, uh, <laughs> you're, you're clapping because it's been such an exciting study to go through 1 Corinthians 16. Before we do that, uh, we got word that Josue has passed phase two of boot camp. He's in the, he's in the final phase. Mercifully, an injury he sustained early on, a sickness he has uh, come across, has not kept him from pursuing this. We're so grateful to God for that. And looking forward to his graduation from boot camp, uh, we'll have representatives there, I'm sure, right, Nettie, Julian? You'll be there, parents' day, to represent us when he graduates. Mm hmm All right, looking toward that, looking toward that. 1 Corinthians 16. We have given this series the overarching theme of the perfect gospel for an imperfect church. And if you've been with us throughout the study, no one should have to convince you that Corinth the church established by the Apostle Paul at Corinth was imperfect. But then, what church is not? This church is imperfect. As much as I love you, as much as I'm grateful to God for the, for the 14 years he's allowed us to be here, you have an imperfect pastor. We're an imperfect congregation. The good news, the really great news, is that the gospel does not depend upon our perfection. It depends upon the perfection of Jesus Christ. And its advance has been committed to imperfect, but saved by grace through faith, sinners. And so we come today to wrap up this letter. I would just remind you before we read this passage, Paul began it after introducing it to just scathing rebuke for their divisiveness. They, they had a party spirit among them. They were choosing up preachers for crying out loud. Well, you can like Brother So-and-So if you want to, but Brother, brother So-and-So is my favorite preacher. Paul said, this is not healthy. They were, uh, they were acting like children, he said. They were not being caring and compassionate. They were not making the gospel the main thing. They were, they were winking at and allowing immorality in the congregation. They were taking one another to court. They were, they were teaching wrong things about marriage. Uh, they, they were misunderstanding liberty. Uh, they were abusing the Lord's Supper. They were abusing spiritual gifts. He had to inject an entire, what we recognize as a chapter, on love because it was so lacking. And then while they acknowledged that Jesus had risen, they denied the resurrection of followers of Christ. It was a, it was a truly troubled church. And yet look what he says as he closes out. Stand with me if you would. If you found 1 Corinthians 16, 19 to 24 in your Bibles, if not, We've got the text on the screen for you so that you can hear and see <clears throat> and read the Word of God. The churches of Asia send you greetings. Aquila and Prisca, together with the church in their house, send you hearty greetings in the Lord. All the brothers send you greetings. Greet one another with a holy kiss. I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. If anyone has no love for the Lord, let him be accursed. O oh Lord, come. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with you. My love be with you all in Christ Jesus. Amen. What have we just read together? The inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. And may the Lord press upon us in new and fresh ways as we receive this exhortation that no matter how messy church life is, 
no matter how frustrating relationships can be, that each of us, saved by grace through faith, called by God to be followers of Christ, is also called to participate actively, energetically, intentionally in building gospel community. Thank you. Please be seated. Gospel community. That's where we're headed next. I think it's interesting. It's fitting. In fact, it was reading through 1 Corinthians that really began to trigger this idea uh, that we will, God willing, begin studying the one another's in the scriptures. The one another's. The scripture does not contemplate that we will live unto ourselves, isolated as followers of Jesus Christ. Isolation is the mark of sons of Adam and daughters of Eve. As soon as they sinned and fell in the garden, they hid themselves from God and from one another. Communion and community is the evidence that God has saved us by grace through faith and brought us back together, placed us into a family. Gospel community. Karen and I have recently begun, again, we did this some years ago, inviting folks over to our home on Sunday evening for coffee and dessert, but ma mainly for fellowship, enjoying one another. I mentioned this to our, to our deacons. I want to mention it to you. Uh, our intention is to have you over. You will have to turn us down. You will have to dodge us. You will have to... Uh, block us from calling, texting, emailing, not to engage in this. And we'll respect this, by the way. Here's what my challenge to you. As I challenged you last week, and some of you responded, to begin looking at the one another's in Scripture. Don't assume that I've found them all. Send them to me in any way you want to. Here's my challenge to you. I want you to think about, I want you to look around and think about who's someone here that I don't know that well that I would love to get to know. That's my challenge. And let us know that. And we'll do our best. We've already started piecing some families together. Uh, as of tonight, we will have had eight families over in the month of July. Uh, and then let me know that. Let me know. So, you know, I, I don't know so-and-so really well. I would like to get to know them better. And God being our helper, Karen and I will arrange the opportunity for that uh, in our home on Sunday evenings. And it may end up in other evenings too, but for right now. Sunday evenings. We're about finished with our study on Sunday nights. We've got three more sessions, the eighth session tonight and the nine and ten. And once we do that, then we will take a brief break on Sunday evenings, and we will be using that continually. We're not going to stop having people over to do, to do a time of fellowship. Here's another challenge. As we engage in this, as the one another's begin to ring through our minds and our hearts, and we're increasingly impressed that we are not called to live in isolation, not even as a family in isolation, a family unit, that you then will begin doing some of these things too. And we'll talk with you more about that. So what about this text? Well, I want us to see <clears throat> four things here today. First, a gospel community is one that shows hospitality. Then a gospel community is one that shows affection. Third, a gospel community is one that has a genuine love for the Lord. Finally, a gospel community is one that has a genuine love for one another. And if you read 1 John, you'll recognize that you cannot separate those two. You cannot really love the Lord and be complacent about one another. John says it's impossible. So first of all, a gospel community is one that shows hospitality. I want to commend to you again Rosaria Butterfield's book, the gospel comes with a house key. Just quickly, her story. She was a radical feminist, a lesbian who had a, a lesbian partner teaching, uh, teaching women's studies uh, at, a, at a highly acclaimed university. And a pastor and his wife encountered her, began to love her, reached out to her. The Lord used their hospitality to bring her to faith in Christ. Today, 20-something years later, she is married, has children, and her book, The Gospel Comes with a House Key, will challenge you, humble you, strengthen you, 
and enable you to recognize and put into practice hospitality. The word hospitality, by the way. You're familiar with the word uh, xenophobia, perhaps. Xenophobia. It's a phobia from fear, xeno from strangers or foreigners, a fear of foreigners. The word for hospitality in the New Testament is the word a love of strangers. A love of strangers. And we're expected to show hospitality. Look at our passage. The churches of Asia send you greetings. What does that tell you? And now is Paul making this up? Is he just, you know, it's like the fella asked the preacher one time after a sermon, preacher, when you said such and such day, were you, were you telling the truth or were you just preaching? Is, is Paul just, just blowing smoke here? No, I don't believe so. I believe that he is in communication with these churches. He, in this instance, he reminds me a lot of how my mother was. We had six children in our family, and when you would call mom on Saturday, Friday or Saturday, she would catch you up with everybody. We knew I could make one phone call and know exactly what's happening in all the family units. She was, when she died, my brother Tom said, we've lost the central nervous system of our family. Paul was that to gospel churches. He, he was, if you want to understand Pastor Joseph's role in Haiti, the, he's the Haitian side of the Haiti Collective. He's sort of like that. You could talk with Pastor Joseph and know almost immediately how the churches in the Haiti Collective are doing. That's what Paul's doing here. The churches of Asia send you greetings. Well, if, if I'm sitting in, in the church in Corinth, I immediately think, he's told the churches in Asia about us. That's encouraging. My second thought would be, Oh my goodness, what has he told the churches in Asia about us? But he's connected. Aquila and Priscilla, or Prisca, together with the church in their house, sends you hearty greetings. He probably uh, stayed with them in the Lord. He talks with them about them. He, he, share, he sends out communications to pray for what's going on in the churches. You see, it's uh, when he's, when he's, when he's going to send... Uh, representatives to Corinth. He expects them to show hospitality to the folks coming in. You see, in the New Testament church, because they needed one another, they were hunted. By the way, the church in Saudi Arabia needs one another. Because in the New Testament church, they needed one another. They welcomed one another. They, there was not the mentality, well, it was good to see you today. I look forward to seeing you next week. That was not a mentality in the New Testament church. In fact, you read the book of Acts, you realize that early on, it was, as, as often as they could, daily sometimes, they were getting together. You say, but Brother Bill, that was first century A.D. True. Read about the first great awakening. In the first great awakening in this country, when God came down in power through his spirit, through the preaching of, of Jonathan Edwards and, and George Whitfield and John Wesley and others, Here's what, here's what you would experience. Someone would summon a, a pastor to a community to preach. A protracted meeting, as they called them then. And he would preach. He had a schedule to preach a certain number of days. And he would begin to send out notes to fellow pastors. I need you to come. I need your help. Because the meeting is going on nightly into weeks. They would finish preaching would go to the home where they were staying, usually the pastor's home. They would be followed by young people saying, talk to us more. We want to hear more about our need. For, we want to hear more about the hope of the gospel. This was happening all over. In Wales, in the First Great Awakening, the mule drivers, the coal miners who had their mule teams, had to retrain their mules to respond. Their, their mouths were so filthy in their cursing. And when the Lord saved them, they had to retrain their animals to respond to a new set of commands. It was just it was an incredible time, the downpour of the Spirit. So hospitality was woven into the gospel. It would be impossible for someone in, in the first century to think, I was an alien, I was a stranger, I was an outcast, I was a Gentile. And God broke in and saved me by His grace and for His glory. And He placed me into a body of people, some who were Jews who are now Christians, some who are Gentiles who are now Christians, some who were temple prostitutes, some who were priests. I'm in a family. It would be unthinkable for them to say, well, we just go to church together. 
That was not a mentality. And to the extent that it might be in today's fast-paced culture, we are the poorer for that. We're not the richer. When Paul says in Galatians, we went through Galatians several years ago, bear one another's burdens. He anticipated that you would be in close enough proximity, familiar enough with life situations that you would be there to bear one another's burdens. You see, the language of the Scripture is that no one is an island. To treat church membership as part-time is not healthy for you and certainly not modeling the power of the gospel. The power of the gospel is best modeled when people who would have otherwise very few things in common find a great commonality in Jesus Christ. That that experience of grace overshadows every other issue and brings you together as one. And so he, he shows us that it, the gospel, a gospel community demonstrates hospitality. Karen and I have challenged ourselves to be more obviously uh, intentional, uh, preemptively hospitable. I challenge you to join us in this at different levels. You may say, well, I, I don't know that my, my dwelling would accommodate people coming over. It's not an issue. We got a big one here and we'll make rooms available. We're going to remove every uh, hindrance from this happening. Those who have been with us so far, I think, would say that they were not disappointed that we didn't have a seven-course meal and entertainment. It was, it was simple. Uh, it, it was a cheesecake that Karen makes that I can eat, and I do. Some fruit on it, ice cream, cookies, coffee, water, simple. But I'll tell you from my perspective, so, so enriching, so enriching. I want you to think one another, one another. Yes, there are implications for one another between husband and wife. There are implications for one another between parents and children. There are impl implications for one another among the siblings. But it goes beyond that. One another. The gospel comes with a house key and calls us to show hospitality. The second thing I want you to see is that Let me point something out real quickly before we go there. There's a story told where Jesus was invited by Simon a Pharisee to his home. It's in, it's in Luke 7, uh, verses 36 to 50. I want to tell you a little bit about it. Then we're going to read verses 40 to 47. He invited Jesus to eat with him. Jesus went and reclined at the table. And there was a woman of the city, a woman who had, had a bad reputation, uh, who was known as a sinner. The, 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 for the Pharisees, Anybody that wasn't them was a sinner. And then there were notorious sinners. And she heard that Jesus was there. I want you to put yourself there a minute. And she went into the house, uninvited. How rude. She brought a flask of ointment of alabaster with her. Standing beside him at his feet, weeping. She began to wet his feet with her tears and wipe them. He's lying down here. She's standing beside him. Her tears are so profuse, they begin to fall on Jesus' feet. And she's probably somewhat embarrassed initially. And she stoops down and takes her hair and begins to wipe the tears off his feet with her hair. And she kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. So the Pharisee, who'd invited Jesus, to the dinner. Looks hospitable. Said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what sort of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. So, with high hopes inviting the rabbi who was creating such a stir, this man begins to be disappointed because of the way Jesus is so undiscerning as to recognize that he's letting a sinner touch him. And then it gets interesting. Verse 40, Jesus answering him said, Simon, I have something to say to you. He said, say it, teacher. In other words, you're the teacher. I'm teachable. 
A certain money lender had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii, the other 50. When they could not pay, he canceled the debt of both. Now which of them will love him more? Simon answered, the one I suppose for whom he canceled the larger debt. Jesus said to him, you've judged rightly. Then turning toward the woman, now watch this, he is looking at her, but he is talking to Simon. Turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? Fascinating question. He saw her, but he didn't really see her. Do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, which would have been customary to have one of the, one of the servants come and, with a basin of water to wash the feet of the, of the person who'd been journeying in very, very dirty, sandy situations. You gave me no water for my feet, but she's wet my feet with her tears, wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, the holy kiss, the, the greeting of one another, traditional. Remember, you peck on one cheek, on another cheek, sometimes on the forehead. That's a welcome. It's touching. It shows compassion. It shows affection. I told you, I've told you this before, I'll just remind you. When I was in Russia 20 or so years ago, we'd flown all night. Got to our apartment, waked up the next morning, ushered into the gathering of the leadership of the Nizhny Novgorod Baptist Church in the, in the cellar. The pastor was there, the elders, the deacons. I knew a couple of Russian words. Bratsy, brother. And so our interpreter said, why don't you go around and introduce yourself to, to the, to the Bratsy? So I went around, and the first fellow I walk up to to shake his hand grabs me on the shoulders, kisses me on the mouth, and says, Bratsy. Well, that was stunning, but there were about ten of them in the room. And I didn't get missed by one of them. It's the culture. That they were greeting me. They were showing me they welcomed me. Jesus says, you didn't give me a kiss. She's not stopped ceasing to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, another, another expression of coming in from a dusty journey to be a cooling effect. But she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore I tell you, her sins which are many are forgiven, for she loved much. And here's the zinger. The lesson, now the application. For she loved, she was forgiven. She loved much. But he who is forgiven little loves little. Let me ask you today, do you, do you think, when you think back on your profession of faith, and we should never forget that, we should never grow far beyond that, always remember, were you forgiven a little? Or were you forgiven much? And we can articulate, but Jesus says you can observe it. If you're forgiven a little, you'll love a little. If you've been forgiven much, you will love profusely. And he's teaching Simon about hospitality. I think what you discover, we're not going to do an exposition of that passage today, is Simon brought Jesus into his home not for what he could show and give to Jesus, but for what he could get from Jesus. He didn't even show basic hospitality. The second thing is a gospel community is one that shows affection. And so we have this greet one another with a holy kiss. It's the, it was the mark of that culture. Cheek, cheek, sometimes forehead. Mamas and daddies and grandmas and grandpas will kiss their grandchildren on the forehead. Tender affection. Do you know that one of the things that wrecks people socially when they are children, when they're infants, is not being touched, when they're deprived of touch? Have we learned on Sunday nights in a new and fresh way that 
that holding hands, the touch, means so much to a woman. And yet, while I appreciate a society that wants to be clean and free of germs, and I understand all of that, and I don't expect any of you to walk by when the service is over and kiss me on the mouth. Please don't. But a hug, a handshake, that, that physical touch means so much in a gospel community. How many people do we speak with, even in this setting, that we don't ever touch? Touch closes the gap. Greet one another with a holy kiss. It became a holy kiss. It's, that term is added, really, uh, in the culture with the gospel, a sanctified kiss. I did a study years ago with some young people who were, they were getting kind of physically active and, and the word was getting to me that they were wanting to have make-out sessions and stuff like that. So I thought, we're just going to study on kissing. Because when I talk with them, they say, well, what's wrong with that? And I said, well, that's the wrong question. The question is, what is right about it? There's a study in Scripture on kissing. They didn't like it very much. We looked at every instance in the Scripture on kissing. There's the kiss of the prostitute, the seductress. There's the kiss of the, uh, of the married couple. Uh, there's the, the, the kiss of the betrayer, Judas, who used the greeting of the day in a most despicable way. And then there's the, there's the kiss of culture, the greeting kiss. I said, there's no, none of those allow for prolonged kissing among two people who are not married. I'm not saying people don't do that. I'm just saying the Scripture does not recognize the legitimacy of that. And so I said, are you acting like your spouses? Because you're not. And prolonged kissing doesn't even come into the arena of, of the greeting kiss. That only leaves the kiss of the prostitute. So which are you? And I ask them this. Are you prostitute or are you pimp? You're one of the two. As I said, they didn't appreciate the study, but I laid it out there for them to see what the Scripture teaches. Greet one another with this holy kiss. It was an expression of brotherly love. There's your hospitality again. The, the Zeno, stranger, phileo, love, the love of strangers. But this, in this case, gospel community, if we're going to love strangers the way we need to, we're going to learn to love one another more profusely because, see, when people come into a climate where there is brotherly love, brotherly affection, there's a sense of that. There's a sense of that. Strangers will not be drawn to a place where, the, where it's a bunch of strangers. They're drawn to affection. And so you have these, these references. I just want to cite them real quickly for you. Romans 16, 16, greet one another with a holy kiss. All the churches of Christ greet you. 2 Corinthians 13, 12, greet one another with a holy kiss. 1 Thessalonians 5, 26, which we read, greet all the brothers with a holy kiss. 1 Peter 5, 14, greet one another with the kiss of love. Peace to all of you who are in Christ. This was expressed, notice, to several churches. And so what he was saying was, in the culture, there's a kiss, cheek, cheek, or forehead. It's, 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 it's appropriate. But in the church, there's affection. It's not just welcome. It's not just tradition. It's attended with affection. And so the challenge I would ask you, because there are different ways to show affection clearly, is how do you show affection to the brothers in this congregation, the brothers and sisters? And, you, and it does not have to involve your lips on their forehead or their cheeks. And certainly not on their mouths. So how do you do that? How do you do that? How do you show affection? Because see, a gospel community is brimming with that. It's, it's infectious. It's contagious. It's, uh, it's palpable. It was one of the compelling things in the New Testament for people who don't like outcasts. So you move from Jesus scolding the Pharisee for not giving him a kiss to Paul admonishing the Corinthians to show gospel affection to build a gospel community, to just, as I said a while ago, Judas 
used a kiss to betray. This is, this is why Jesus says uh, in, the, in the gospel accounts, it's cited in Mark, it's cited in Matthew, but in Luke, he says, verse 48 of chapter 22, Judas, would you betray the Son of Man with a kiss? Do you hear that? Of all the ways, you could have walked into the garden and said, there he is. That's the one. You could have described me and they could have just come upon me and laid hands on me. But you would walk up to me and take that tender, affectionate expression that, there, that there's something between us. And you would use the kiss to betray the Son of Man. You hear the pathos in that. That's how critical this demonstration was in the day that Jesus walked the earth. The ultimate betrayal. So the third thing I want you to see. It's a gospel community is one that has a genuine love for the Lord. Paul writes, now at this point in the letter, you gotta get, he's, had, he's had an amanuensis, which is a fancy word. This is someone taking dictation as he's giving dictation of the letter. Paul had eyesight problems. He had, he'd been beaten several times. But he takes now this scroll. And he says, I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. In other words, this is not a forgery. If anyone has no love for the Lord, let him be accursed. Our Lord, come. Oh. This letter, he has challenged them in how they're not showing love. He's written a whole section on what love is, what love does. And now he's saying, it's, it's, it's like, I don't know where some of you stand in Corinth, but if you have no love, let him be anathema. The word anathema there, it's, it's poorly translated in the English versions. Disqualified for the prize, you'll read something. Let him be cast into hell. Cast into perdition. He said the only place fitting for a person who does not love the Lord and especially for one who has masqueraded within the local congregation as if he does love the Lord, the only place fitting is to be thrown into hell. And so there's two words juxtaposed here in the Greek. Let him be anathema. And one other word, maranatha. Come, Lord. Come, Lord. Some commentators suggests that he's tied Maranatha in an unusual way because Maranatha typically in the New Testament is the cry of the people of God who are facing persecution and pressure and long for Jesus to return to take them home. That's the typical use of Maranatha. And it may well be that here. He may be putting a strong contrast. Some have suggested, though, that he is using Maranatha here. Lord, come and cast these into hell who do not love the Lord and say that they do. That's how he saw that cancer in the church at Corinth. To pretend to love Jesus and not love him. To just be hanging on out of tradition. Uh, to be different. To whatever you fill in the blank. And so John says in 2 John 9 verses 9 and 10, everyone who goes on ahead and does not abide in the teaching of Christ does not have God. Whoever abides in the teaching it doesn't say knows the teaching. It doesn't even say teaches the teaching. Abides in it. Lives in it. Dwells in it. Immerses himself or herself in it. Whoever abides in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. And if anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not receive him into your house or give him any greeting. Anathema. Anathema. He has ramped it up through the whole letter now, pointing out how they're being unloving. Now he says, here are the implications. As I pray for Corinth to grow, to repent, to, to become Christ-like, I also pray that God will not allow 
any to remain in that assembly who will be a problem for it, who will undermine the agape love, the, the phileo love that ought to mark the body of Christ. That's how earnest Paul is about this. Finally, a gospel community is one that has a genuine love for one another. Now you would not expect, I promise you, if you just read the letter and didn't know how it ended in these verses, you would not expect Paul to say this. After he has scathingly denounced them for having a party spirit, scathingly denounced them for winking at immorality, scathingly denounced them for taking one another to court, and on and on and on. I mean, thundering, blistering rebukes. Listen to this. You wonder, well, did Paul love them? Listen to this. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. I don't think you can get two verses that contrast more powerfully. Anathema, Maranatha, the grace. May you know the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so that they don't misunderstand and think that it's just preacher talk, my love be with you all in Christ Jesus. Know that I love you. This, I believe, is one of the most powerful applications and demonstrations of what speaking the truth in love looks like. And the Apostle Paul, led by the Spirit, pulls it off brilliantly. My love be with you all. He loved the church at Corinth. I love Bethel Baptist Church. Do you? Do you? Not the institution. Not the building. Not the idea. The people. Could you say, without hypocrisy, my love be with all of you in Christ Jesus? And if you could say it, do people know it? Do people know it? The gospel comes with a house key. It's hospitable. It fights the fight of faith to carve out time in a busy world to show hospitality. And I'm not talking about the circle of people you're comfortable with <clears throat> that you get together with freely, regularly. That's wonderful. God bless you for that. But the devil can even use that to isolate you from the rest of the people of God. A gospel community is one of affection. Have you thought about how you show affection to others? Or do you just assume that they know that that's in your heart for them? Like maybe you know, you assume that they know that your love is with all of them. I want us, as we wrap up this letter and look forward to another series on the one another's, I want us to be willing to be challenged, exhorted, to be willing to examine ourselves and then take the steps that are right, appropriate, necessary, to be sure, to be sure that those who are members of this church know that we have a godly affection toward them, a love in Christ for them. Know that through tangible demonstrations of hospitality that we receive them into our sphere of influence. We receive them into our lives. We want to get to know them for the simple reason that God has saved us and God has saved them and brought us together in a local congregation. And I believe as we do this better with more intentionality that the love of the stranger will become more and more powerful. And God will use it in ways that you can't imagine right now. One of our folks has loved on strangers. More than one has, but I want to tell you about one. And that love for them brought them into our sphere of influence so that we had the opportunity, the painful opportunity yesterday, of burying their nine-month-old child who died in bed. 
God willing, that family will be coming among us with all their hurts, pains. But they wouldn't have darkened the doors of this place had someone not loved them like Jesus. Show them the gospel of affection. And now we will have the opportunity, I believe, to shower that upon them. But you see, loving the strangers, right to do, will seem empty if they don't sense that we love one another. Let's pray. Dear Holy Father, you're the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we read in the scriptures the love that the Father has for the Son, the love the Son has for the Father, the love Father and Son has for the Spirit, and the love the Spirit has for each. And we know that your church has been called to be a dwelling place of love. And that we are to have love one for another. That that's one of the ways the world will see and come to believe that Jesus is your Messiah. He is the Savior of sinners. It's when they look into the church and see love for one another. I pray that you will take this letter and press it upon our minds and hearts. That your banner over us as love will be your marching word for us. Love for you. Love for one another. Love for others. And that you will powerfully meet with us in the challenge that's going to wash over us Sunday after Sunday. One another. One another. One another. for your glory, for the lifting up of Jesus, for the advance of the gospel, and for our own sanctification. We ask this in Jesus' name.